a Wikividi documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Ireland. Ireland is an island in the North Atlantic. It is separated from Great Britain to its east by the North Channel, the Irish Sea, and St. George's Channel. Ireland is the second largest island of the British Isles, the third largest in Europe, and the 20th largest on Earth. Politically, Ireland is divided between the Republic of Ireland, which covers five-sixths of the island, and Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. In 2011, the population of Ireland was about 6.6 .6 million, ranking it the second most populous island in Europe after Great Britain. Just under 4.8 million live in the Republic of Ireland, and just over 1.8 million live in Northern Ireland. The island's geography comprises relatively low-lying mountains surrounding a central plain, with several navigable rivers extending inland. Its lush vegetation is a product of its mild, but changeable climate which is free of extremes in temperature. It was covered by thick woodlands until the Middle Ages, as of 2013. The amount of land that is wooded in Ireland is about 11% of the total, compared with a European average of 35%. There are 26 extant mammal species native to Ireland. The Irish climate is influenced by the Atlantic Ocean and thus very moderate, and winters are milder than expected for such a northerly area, although summers are cooler than those in continental Europe. Rainfall and cloud cover are abundant. The earliest evidence of human presence in Ireland is dated at 10,500 BCE. Gaelic Ireland had emerged by the 1st century AD. The island was Christianized from the 5th century onward. Following the 12th century Norman invasion, England claimed sovereignty. However, English rule did not extend over the whole island until the 16th-17th century Tudor conquest which led to colonization by settlers from Britain. In the 1690s, a system of Protestant English rule was designed to materially disadvantage the Catholic majority and Protestant dissenters, and was extended during the 18th century. With the Acts of Union in 1801, Ireland became a part of the United Kingdom. A war of independence in the early 20th century was followed by the partition of the island, creating the Irish Free State which became increasingly sovereign over the following decades, and Northern Ireland, which remained a part of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland saw much civil unrest from the late 1960s until the 1990s. This subsided following a political agreement in 1998. In 1973 the Republic of Ireland joined the European Economic Community while the United Kingdom, and Northern Ireland, as part of it, did the same. Irish culture has had a significant influence on other cultures, especially in the fields of literature. Alongside mainstream Western culture, a strong indigenous culture exists, as expressed through Gaelic games, Irish music and the Irish language. The island's culture shares many features with that of Great Britain, including the English language, and sports such as association football, rugby, horse racing, and golf. Prehistoric Island During the last glacial period, and up until about 10,000 BC, most of Ireland was periodically covered in ice. Sea levels were lower and Ireland, like Great Britain, formed part of continental Europe. By 16,000 BC, rising sea levels due to ice melting caused Ireland to become separated from Great Britain. Later, around 6,000 BC, Great Britain itself became separated from continental Europe. The earliest evidence of human presence in Ireland is dated at 10,500 BC, demonstrated by a butchered bare bone found in a cave in County Clare. It is not until about 8,000 BC, however, that more sustained occupation of the island has been shown, with evidence for Mesolithic communities around the island. These Mesolithic communities lived as hunter-gatherers across the island until about 4000 BC. Sometime before 4000 BC, Neolithic settlers arrived introducing cereal cultivars, domesticated animals such as cattle and sheep, large timber building, and stone monuments. The earliest evidence for farming in Ireland, or Great Britain is from Ferreter's Cove, 
Kerry, where a flint knife, cattle bones and a sheep's tooth were carbon dated to circa 4350 BC. Field systems were developed in different parts of Ireland, including at the seed fields, that has been preserved beneath a blanket of peat in present-day Tiroli, an extensive field system, arguably the oldest in the world, consisted of small divisions separated by dry stone walls. The fields were farmed for several centuries between 3500 BC and 3000 BC. Wheat and barley were the principal crops. The Bronze Age defined by the use of metal began around 2500 BC, with technology changing people's everyday lives during this period through innovations such as the wheel, harnessing oxen, weaving textiles, brewing alcohol, and skillful metalworking, which produced new weapons and tools, along with fine gold decoration and jewelry, such as brooches and torques, according to John T. Koch and others. Ireland in the Late Bronze Age was part of a maritime trading network culture called the Atlantic Bronze Age that also included Britain, Western France and Iberia, and that this is where Celtic languages developed. This contrasts with the traditional view that their origin lies in mainland Europe with the Hallstatt culture. Emergence of Celtic Ireland During the Iron Age, a Celtic language and culture emerged in Ireland. How and when the island became Celtic has been debated for close to a century, with the migrations of the Celts being one of the more enduring themes of archaeological and linguistic studies. Today, there is more than one school of thought on how this occurred. The long-standing traditional view, once widely accepted, is that the Celtic language, Oem script and culture were brought to Ireland by waves of invading or migrating Celts from mainland Europe. This theory draws on the Lebagabala Iren, a medieval Christian pseudo-history of Ireland along with the presence of Celtic culture, language and artefacts found in Ireland such as Celtic bronze spears, shields, torques, and other finely crafted Celtic-associated possessions. The theory holds that there were four separate Celtic invasions of Ireland. The Prydany was said to be the first, followed by the Belgae from Northern Gaul and Britain. Later, Laian tribes from Armorica were said to have invaded Ireland and Britain more or less simultaneously. Lastly, the Miletians were said to have reached Ireland from either Northern Iberia or Southern Gaul. It was claimed that a second wave named the Uerni, belonging to the Belgae people of Northern Gaul, began arriving about the 6th century BC. They were said to have given their name to the island. A more recent theory, with broad support among archaeologists, is that Celtic culture and language arrived in Ireland as a result of cultural diffusion. This theory proposes that the Celticization of Ireland may have been the culmination of a long process of social and economic interaction between Ireland, Britain and adjacent parts of continental Europe. The theory was advanced in part because of lack of archaeological evidence for large-scale Celtic immigration, though it is accepted that such movements are notoriously difficult to identify. Some proponents of this theory hold that it is likely that there was migration of smaller groups of Celts to Ireland, with sufficiently regular traffic to constitute a migration stream, but that this was not the fundamental cause of insular Celticization. Historical linguists are skeptical that this method alone could account for the absorption of the Celtic language, with some saying that an assumed processional view of Celtic linguistic formation is an especially hazardous exercise. Genetic lineage investigation into the area of Celtic migration to Ireland has led to findings that showed no significant differences in mitochondrial DNA between Ireland and large areas of continental Europe. In contrast to parts of the Y chromosome pattern, when taking both into account a study drew the conclusion that modern Celtic speakers in Ireland could be thought of as European, Atlantic Celts showing a shared ancestry throughout the Atlantic zone from northern Iberia to western Scandinavia rather than substantially Central European. In 2012, research showed that occurrence of genetic markers for the earliest farmers was almost eliminated by beaker culture immigrants. They carried what was then a new Y chromosome R1B marker, believed to have originated in Iberia about 2500 BC. The prevalence amongst modern Irish men for this mutation is a remarkable 84%, the highest in the world. 
and closely matched in other populations along the Atlantic fringes down to Spain. A similar genetic replacement happened with lineages in mitochondrial DNA. The implication of this evidence is a series of migrations and the arrival of the early Irish language, giving some credence to the tales in Leba Gabala Iren. Late Antiquity and Early Medieval Times The earliest written records of Ireland come from classical Greco-Roman geographers. Ptolemy in his Almagest refers to Ireland as Micra Bretonia, in contrast to the larger island, which he called Mechel Bretonia. In his later work, Geography, Ptolemy refers to Ireland as Uernia and to Great Britain as Albion. These, new, names were likely to have been the local names for the islands at the time. The earlier names, in contrast, were likely to have been coined before direct contact with local peoples was made. The Romans would later refer to Ireland by this name too in its Latinized form, Hibernia, or Scotia. Ptolemy records 16 nations inhabiting every part of Ireland in 100 AD. The relationship between the Roman Empire and the kingdoms of ancient Ireland is unclear. However, a number of finds of Roman coins have been made. For example, at the Iron Age settlement of Freestone Hill near Gowran and Newgrange, Ireland continued as a patchwork of rival kingdoms but, beginning in the 7th century, a concept of national kingship gradually became articulated through the concept of a High King of Ireland. Medieval Irish literature portrays an almost unbroken sequence of High Kings stretching back thousands of years. But modern historians believe the scheme was constructed in the 8th century to justify the status of powerful political groupings by projecting the origins of their rule into the remote past. All of the Irish kingdoms had their own kings, but were nominally subject to the High King. The High King was drawn from the ranks of the provincial kings and ruled also the royal kingdom of Meath, with a ceremonial capital at the Hill of Tara. The concept didn't become a political reality until the Viking Age and even then was not a consistent one. Ireland did have a culturally unifying rule of law, the early written judicial system, the Brehon Laws, administered by a professional class of jurists known as the Bronze. The Chronicle of Ireland records that in 431, Bishop Pilardius arrived in Ireland on a mission from Pope Celestine I to minister to the Irish, already believing in Christ. The same chronicle records that St. Patrick, Ireland's best-known patron saint, arrived the following year. There is continued debate over the missions of Palladius and Patrick, but the consensus is that they both took place and that the older Druid tradition collapsed in the face of the new religion. Irish Christian scholars excelled in the study of Latin and Greek learning and Christian theology. In the monastic culture that followed the Christianization of Ireland, Latin and Greek learning was preserved in Ireland during the early Middle Ages in contrast to elsewhere in Europe, where the Dark Ages followed the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The arts of manuscript illumination, metalworking and sculpture flourished and produced treasures such as the Book of Kells or nature jewelry and the many carved stone crosses that still dot the island today. A mission founded in 563 on Iona by the Irish monk St. Columba began a tradition of Irish missionary work that spread Celtic Christianity and learning to Scotland, England, and the Frankish Empire on continental Europe after the fall of Rome. These missions continued until the late Middle Ages, establishing monasteries and centres of learning producing scholars such as Sir Julius Scotus and Johannes Origina and exerting much influence in Europe. From the 9th century, waves of Viking raiders plundered Irish monasteries and towns. These raids added to a pattern of raiding and endemic warfare that was already deep-seated in Ireland. The Vikings also were involved in establishing most of the major coastal settlements in Ireland, Dublin, Limerick, Cork, Wexford, Waterford, as well as other smaller settlements. Norman and English Invasions On 1 May 1169, an expedition of Cambro Norman knights with an army of about 600 landed at Banau Strand in present-day County Wexford. It was led by Richard de Clare, called Strongbow due to his prowess as an archer. 
The invasion, which coincided with the period of renewed Norman expansion, was at the invitation of Dermot MacMurrow, the King of Leinster, in 1166. MacMurrow had fled to Anjou, France, following a war involving Tyrone and Uerork, of Braefn, and sought the assistance of the Angevin king, Henry II, in recapturing his kingdom. In 1171, Henry arrived in Ireland in order to review the general progress of the expedition. He wanted to re-exert royal authority over the invasion which was expanding beyond his control. Henry successfully reimposed his authority over Strongbow and the Cambro-Norman warlords and persuaded many of the Irish kings to accept him as their overlord, an arrangement confirmed in the 1175 Treaty of Windsor. The invasion was legitimized by the provisions of the papal bull Lord Abelita, issued by Adrian IV in 1155. The bull encouraged Henry to take control in Ireland in order to oversee the financial and administrative reorganization of the Irish Church and its integration into the Roman Church system. Some restructuring had already begun at the ecclesiastical level following the Synod of Kells in 1152. There has been significant controversy regarding the authenticity of Lord Abilita, and there is no general agreement as to whether the bull was genuine or a forgery. In 1172, the new Pope, Alexander III, further encouraged Henry to advance the integration of the Irish Church with Rome. Henry was authorized to impose a tithe of one penny per half as an annual contribution. This church levy, called Peter's Pence, is extant in Ireland as a voluntary donation. In turn, Henry accepted the title of Lord of Ireland which Henry conferred on his younger son, John Lackland, in 1185. This defined the Irish state as the Lordship of Ireland. When Henry's successor died unexpectedly in 1199, John inherited the Crown of England and retained the Lordship of Ireland. Over the century that followed, Norman feudal law gradually replaced the Gaelic Brehon law so that by the late 13th century the Norman Irish had established a feudal system throughout much of Ireland. Norman settlements were characterized by the establishment of baronies, manors, towns and the seeds of the modern county system. A version of the Magna Carta, substituting Dublin for London and the Irish Church for the English Church at the time, the Catholic Church, was published in 1216 and the Parliament of Ireland was founded in 1297. From the mid-14th century, after the Black Death, Norman settlements in Ireland went into a period of decline. The Norman rulers and the Gaelic-Irish elites intermarried and the areas under Norman rule became Gaelicized. In some parts, a hybrid Hiberno-Norman culture emerged. In response, the Irish Parliament passed the Statutes of Kilkenny in 1367. These were a set of laws designed to prevent the assimilation of the Normans into Irish society by requiring English subjects in Ireland to speak English, follow English customs and abide by English law. By the end of the 15th century Central English authority in Ireland had all, but disappeared into renewed Irish culture and language, albeit with Norman influences, was dominant again. English crown control remained relatively unshaken in an amorphous foothold around Dublin known as the Pale, and under the provisions of Poyning's Law of 1494. The Irish parliamentary legislation was subject to the approval of the English Parliament. The Kingdom of Ireland The title of King of Ireland was recreated in 1542 by Henry VIII, then King of England, of the Tudor dynasty. English rule was reinforced and expanded in Ireland during the latter part of the 16th century, leading to the Tudor conquest of Ireland. A near-complete conquest was achieved by the turn of the 17th century, following the Nine Years' War and the flight of the Earls. This control was consolidated during the wars and conflicts of the 17th century, including the English and Scottish colonization in the plantations of Ireland, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms and the Williamite War. Irish losses during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms are estimated to include 20,000 battlefield casualties. 200,000 civilians are estimated to have died as a result of a combination of war-related famine, displacement, guerrilla activity and pestilence over the duration of the war. A further 50,000 were sent into indentured servitude in the West Indies. 
Some historians estimate that as much as half of the pre-war population of Ireland may have died as a result of the conflict. The religious struggles of the 17th century left to deep sectarian division in Ireland. Religious allegiance now determined the perception and law of loyalty to the Irish King and Parliament. After the passing of the Test Act 1672, and the victory of the forces of the dual monarchy of William and Mary over the Jacobites, Roman Catholics and non-conforming Protestant dissenters were barred from sitting as members in the Irish Parliament. Under the emerging penal laws, Irish Roman Catholics and dissenters were increasingly deprived of various and sundry civil rights even to the ownership of hereditary property. Additional regressive punitive legislation followed 1703, 1709 and 1728. This completed a comprehensive systemic effort to materially disadvantage Roman Catholics and Protestant dissenters, while enriching a new ruling class of Anglican conformists. The new Anglo-Irish ruling class became known as the Protestant Ascendancy. The Great Frost struck Ireland and the rest of Europe between December 1739 and September 1741, after a decade of relatively mild winters. The winters destroyed stored crops of potatoes and other staples and the poor summers severely damaged harvests. This resulted in the famine of 1740. An estimated 250,000 people died from the ensuing pestilence and disease. The Irish government halted export of corn and kept the army in quarters, but did little more. Local gentry and charitable organizations provided relief, but could do little to prevent the ensuing mortality. In the aftermath of the famine, an increase in industrial production and a surge in trade brought a succession of construction booms. The population soared in the latter part of this century, and the architectural legacy of Georgian Ireland was built. In 1782, Poyning's Law was repealed, giving Ireland legislative independence from Great Britain for the first time since 1495. The British government, however, still retained the right to nominate the government of Ireland without the consent of the Irish Parliament. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries Would you like to know more?